lining of the gut with the mucosa where absorption of, of nutrients go on and also of water and so on. And then here within this layer, this is not um, depicted in that picture, um, resides our immune system, which is the largest part actually of our immune system resides within the gut. And um, furthermore, within the muscular cell layer, there resides the myenteric plexus and both of them regulate crucial functions of the gut, such as gut motility. And this is a nice picture. Um, while I was talking, you saw this little gut. This is actually a guinea pig gut uh, moving in a petri dish in physiological solution. And this um, is um, a, a kind contribution of my dear colleague, Michael Schiemann from the TU in Munich. And they are doing a lot of ENS research. And what is really extraordinary with the enteric nervous system is that it is really able to um, coordinate the GI function without any outer input. So it's able um, to process information. In this case, um, it detects the inside of the gut, these little pellets, and starts to or pulse them into um, the anal direction. And I think this is quite fascinating that it's able to work on its own without any further input. And this is actually regulated by the myenteric plexus and the submucosal plexus regulates secretional processes. Let's just leave it like this for now. Well, and the enteric nervous system actually constantly talks to our brain in our head. So they are the, the head brain and the gut brain are in constant um, communication, so to speak. And um, only 10% of the communication goes um, from top to bottom, whereas 90% of the communication goes um, from the bottom to the top, so from the gut to um, the brain. And the two nervous systems are directly connected via the vagal nerve, and this is actually um, part of the so-called gut-brain axis or brain-gut axis. Gut-brain or brain-gut axis, depending from your point of view. So, it was Michael Gershon in the 1960s of the last century um, who coined the term the second brain, and it was him who kind of rediscovered uh, the enteric nervous system, which had been first described in the 19th century, but then kind of forgotten. And um, he, and also a dear colleague of us, Emeron Meyer in the UCLA, actually um, did a lot of research uh, to, to confirm what is common sense, that really gut feelings um, exist and are real. And you all might be familiar with expressions like, um, I have a bad gut feeling, when you fall in love, you have butterflies in, in your belly, you can really feel them. And if you feel well, your, your, your belly feels well, or, or for example, um, if you have, um, yeah, if you have something going on like um, an exam or you have to give a talk, you very often have to go to the loo before because your bellies are kind of, yeah, yeah, playing crazy <laughs> whatsoever. And this is actually, yeah, the, the, the little brain of, of, of our gut, um, the second brain. And various uh, experiments have shown that um, not only conscious alarm system, so if anything gets wrong, if you ingest something which is really not good, something toxic, or if you are suffering from, from a, a, a viral or bacterial infection, your system goes crazy and alarm signals um, are, are um, sensed, and nausea and emesis, so acute vomiting goes on because the ENS um, tells uh, the system, you, whatever this is, you have to get rid of it because it's no good for us. So every one of us, I think, has experienced something like that. And, um, but basically most of the signals going on um, in the deeper gut are not sensed by the brain because otherwise we would really, this would drive us crazy. But actually this is, uh, partially 
yeah, this is part of the problem. What's going on if someone is suffering from, for example, irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease and also other disorders which formerly have been termed purely CNS related diseases, but I will come to that later. So um, for the moment, what you have to keep in mind, as deeper we go into the GI system, as weaker processes and also um, perception is, uh, is um, sent to the brain and, and influences the brain, if everything is um, in order. So, and um, I put you here some, um, yeah, some nice books I would like to recommend. Um, which um, highlight in um, basically lay language um, gut research and what we know about the second brain, about the mind-gut uh, mind connection, about um, the so-called um, recently established psychobiotic revolution. And um, I will now go on to introduce you a little further into what can you also read in those books. So what are gut-brain disorders? I'm sorry, I have to shuffle that around because it disturbs my presentation. Um, actually, gut-brain disorders, typical gut-brain disorders are, as I already introduced, irritable bowel syndrome. But um, thanks to the microbiota research, this concept actually um, has been or starts to has been yeah has started let's put it like this to be more and more accepted in the scientific world and actually I have to tell you um, even if I disappoint you now this is not totally new because already Emron Meyer um, whom I introduced earlier with one of his really beautiful books claimed that um, the gut and the brain talk to each other and that disbalances in this gut brain access may contribute to disease but no one a lot of people just didn't listen to this and did take that seriously and thanks to um, the microbiota field uh, which started heavily publishing like 10 years ago people started to realize there's really something going on between the gut and the brain and that not only the genes and i will come to that which um, actually shape our individual molecular makeup but also our gut microbiota shape as we say in human genetics the phenotype which means we are not alone we are a, an ecosystem we are so-called the new concept is we are a holobiont living with our little friends or foes <laughs> depending on the composition um, yeah, together in a, in a balance. This is what is the case in a healthy individual. But if anything goes wrong, may it be um, due to a certain genetic makeup, to any environmental factors, or to um, disbalances, which we call dysbiosis in our microbiota, gut brain orders manifest. And you might see here, um, disorders which you might um, might know as um, CNS related, so central nervous system related disorders, but we can no longer say this. So it's disorders like so IBS and chronic visceral pain, of course, is more gut related, but diseases like depression, fear, like anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, which we heard a little bit about from. Um, Bianca already, autism, as well as neurodegenerative disorders like um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Chorea Huntington, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but also um, multiple sclerosis are, are also gut brain disorders because the belly or the gut plays um, a huge role in them. Unfortunately, due to the lack of time, I can't go into detail here, but what um, is common in all of these disorders is that the gut-brain axis gets disturbed. Um, 
And um, so I told you we are a hollow beyond. We coexist with the microbiota, not, not only in our bellies, so all over in, in our body and on all surfaces we have microbiota, but I for now just concentrate on them. And these gut microbes, which include bacteria and viruses, are in constant um, communication with our human system via the epithelial lining. And um, one major player involved in that, in that communication is serotonin, which acts systemic in the whole body, but also along the, so along the gut-brain axis and also influences the vagal nerve, which is directly connected. So the ENS connects the ENS and, and our, our brain in the head. So, but this also works systemically in our bloodstream and regulates a lot. I will come to that later. Then the immune system. I told you that a huge amount of the immune system, like 80%, resides within the gut. And this also acts systemically. And last, not least, bacterial molecules, which are released and um, are also determined by what we eat, what our lifestyle is, and so on. So, if actually the gut lining breaks due to the fact that we have any kind of insult, may it be an intoxication, um, an, a viral infection, a um, bacterial infection, whatsoever, then this epithelial lining breaks. It opens up and then bacteria, viruses, and or um, any other components like food components can enter in the lower, you know, in the, in, the, in the lining underneath the epithelial lining where the immune system resides. And it interacts with immune cells. And this makes, exerts a lot of stress, yeah? It's, it's put here like stress, infection, Antibiotic use, for example, also shifts the microbiota composition. A poor diet can play a role into this um, direction. And downstream cascades um, are influenced by that. The signaling via the vagal nerve, which directly connects the gut with the brain, but also the stress axis may be impaired. And also, this is not depicted in this picture, um, the visceral sensation can be um, impaired. Let's put it like this for now. But so the start of gut-brain disorders is a leaky gut. And downstream events based on a leaky gut then manifest in, in phenotypes like anxiety, depression, cognitive dysfunction, and impaired social functioning. And these are, especially the latter two, um, should be very familiar after having listened to Bianca's talk, because this is what we also see impaired in autism and in autism spectrum disorders. So actually, gut, micro gut microbes and their interaction with our human system in that so-called hollow beyond um, and the brain really led to a paradigm shift in neuroscience. And um, there is a nice study I want to introduce shortly to you by the group of Emmer and Meyer, who already in the 1970s claimed that the gut brain axis exists. And what they did is they did um, a, um, um, a uh, so-called placebo-controlled study. They, they fed um, women. They had a large group of women. Half of the women they fed with a yogurt with a certain probiotic formula, and the other half of the women, the other half of the group of the women, they fed with um, a dead yogurt. So in this yogurt, no probiotic was included. So the, the good um, bugs which our body um, actually profit from are, are, are called probiotic formulas or probiotics. And what they could see in a paradigm, in a so-called emotional paradigm, where they 
after the feeding of either the real probiotic or the control yogurt, they showed them faces with certain expressions and measured their brain activity in a functional MRI setting. This is um, a functional readout of your um, brain, a readout of your brain function. And to make a long and complicated story short, what they found was the probiotic yogurt led to more well-being, less anxiety, and also activated to a higher activation of brain regions relevant in emotional processing. And I think this is pretty cool. So what else do we know in this? So this actually led to the concept that um, probiotics may act as psychobiotics. This is a new term people use to describe the beneficial effects of probiotics, psychobiotics. And um, I'm very proud to also um, actually share that little review with you because this review has been written by a student um, of the University of Heidelberg, of the, the master um, in neuroscience, who actually listened to our summer lecture series where we are now also, I told you, I advocate for the enteric nervous system for neurogastroenterology and for irritable bowel syndrome. And he listened to my lecture on the ENS and the gut-brain um, interaction. And he was so fascinated that he decided to write a review on that and to even do his master thesis um, on the dysregulation of the gut-brain axis and probiotic um, supplementation in schizophrenia patients. He did a master thesis on that and this I want to show um, you this review where he collected the information actually on current clinical research um, on the intestinal uh, microbiome which clearly showed alterations not only in schizophrenia patients but also in bipolar patients who are suffering from depression and um, and uh, main, main mania. And um, he also, with his team, actually summed up the clinical research on probiotics. And um, also here, it, they could um, sum up and show that probiotics seem to have a beneficial effect. But the problem we have for now is that the studies have not been performed um, using a certain standard when it comes to microbiota analysis. And therefore, it's hard to compare them and to run meta-analysis over them. But having a look at the single studies, um, each of the, in most of the studies, they could really see an effect. And the same holds true for probiotic treatment, which again also underlies this, underlines this new concept of psychobiotics meaning probiotics as a treatment for psychiatric disorders. And by the way, similar studies are out there also um, for um, autism and other disorders, but due to, yeah, due, due to the shortness of time, I couldn't, um, I couldn't really um, take that into account for today. And um, there is even more studies out there in animal models. And um, of course, this looks super, super promising, but uh, this has to be really also uh, proven in, 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 in human beings. And let's put it like this. There have been even shown structural and functional changes in animal models, which are germ-free, um, compared to animals um, which have a certain microbiota or animal models where germ-free animals um, were given via stool transfer. Um, the stools of certain kind of psychiatric patients and the animals developed symptoms um, which mimic the, the symptoms of the human patients. And I think that's quite intriguing, but that's what I want to share for now. And um, of course, this is not my expertise. I'm just sharing you. So my, yeah, 
an overview from what I knew what colleagues did. This is not what we did ourselves. But now let's come to um, our own research in Heidelberg, irritable bowel syndrome, a prototypical gut brain disorder. So what is irritable bowel syndrome for IBS for short? IBS patients present with certain symptoms which have to be present in combination, such as strong discomfort, abdominal pain, defecation problems, either constipation or diarrhea and bloating. And if this pattern is present, we term the patient an IBS patient. Of course, IBS diagnosis is very time consuming and on average getting an, a, a proper diagnosis for an IBS patient means between three and six years. Or they say running from one doctor to the next doctor because very often until they are seen by a specialist, either a neurogastroenterologist or someone in psychosomatics, because they have the tools. For, uh, uh, oh, I'm not a clinical doctor, but based on my experience, um, a lot of doctors out there still don't take IBS um, for real, and that's the major problem, which means these patients are not getting the help they deserve to get, and although there are outlines there, uh, outlines guidelines um, out there, and um, in, in due time, within the next couple of months, the new German guideline will be published, um, on which we were also experts um, writing the part on the pathophysiology, and our colleagues in the Heidelberg outpatient clinic were involved um, on the clinical de uh, definition part, and in these guidelines, it's exactly defined how to define an IBS patient because currently no biomarkers exist, which means that um, actually IBS diagnosis is made by a um, algorithm, so to speak, excluding all other conditions. And if nothing else is left, then this is an IBS patient. Hmm. So, and we can still not really help them because although there are medications out there which help some of them, but not all of them, we do still not know who responds to which medication, which again makes it really um, difficult for the clinical doctors, but also for the patients because the only way to treat them at the moment is to treat them on a trial and error basis. So we have three main groups, either diarrheic patients with presenting this pain, which are called IBSD, then IBSC patients which, who present this constipation and pain, or a mixed form who suffers from diarrhea plus constipation plus pain. Yeah. So, so they switch. Of course, you cannot have diarrhea and constipation at the same time, that's clear. <laughs> so what, is, what was really fascinating to me from the very beginning was um, the high comorbidity to psychiatric and pain conditions. Because during my PhD thesis, as was introduced in the beginning, I had an interest in psychiatric conditions like um, depression and schizophrenia and others. And due to our work um, on serotonin receptors, we actually got connected to IBS because some of the receptors which we discovered in the human system and had never been described before were actually heavy, heavily expressed in the GI tract only. And we started to wonder why is that and what might their function really be? And that's how I got first to know this condition, irritable bowel syndrome, which was introduced by a colleague of mine when I visited him in Dundee um, at the Nine Wells Hospital. While I was, I, I went there to introduce um, part of my PhD thesis work. And um, actually we discussed options and also how to interpret findings. And actually it was him who proposed that I should have a look at this condition called irritable bowel syndrome. I said, what irritable bowel syndrome, what is that? And he said, 
well, that's a condition, you know, English or Scottish people, well, he nicely tried to explain what that is and I, I didn't really get it. I went, what are you talking about? And then he ended the conversation with like, they have problems to go to the loo. So this is how I got introduced to this condition. I was like, okay, this really sounds like um, an interesting cast. Let's have a look at that. And getting more and more into the topic, I realized that a lot of them also not only suffer from the gastrointestinal phenotype, the diarrhea and the pain in the gut and the constipation, but they also suffer from anxiety and depression, migraine, fibromyalgia, a condition where actually muscular pain takes place, chronic fatigue syndrome, and either some of them or in severe cases, they suffer from all of them. And what I really found quite intriguing and still do is that 40 to 80% of them really comorbidly, as we say, suffer from one or several of these conditions, which really makes their life difficult. And um, they have really a lot of problems in day-to-day -day life. And this is uh, an overview of a study where colleagues of us really kind of uh, measured on, uh, based on questionnaires um, what the symptoms are they suffer from. And you can see what I already introduced to you, the fatigue. Then they are very much irritable. They have sleep disturbances. They suffer from anxiety and, and depression, of course, also from shame, as you can imagine. If you have a belly problem, if you do heavy lip load, you probably um, are not the most popular guy um, yeah, on the, on, yeah, in, in, in the field because um, it's, yeah, it's not nice and they have um, a, lot, a lot of pain as well. Um, decreased appetite, but what is also very intriguing is that, um, of course, it has a, a, a huge impact also on their, um, on their ability to take part um, in social life, also um, meeting friends and family, and also their ability to, to work, yeah? And in severe cases, they have to get early retired because they are not able to, to have um, a normal life. And um, having said this, this is another study from a dear colleague of, um, of mine, from Magnus Simran from Gothenburg, where they actually assess the quality of life, again, similar measures on physical functioning, um, body pain, general health, vitality, social functioning, emotional and mental health, and the blue line represents non-affected normal individuals. And you can already see even normal people are not always super happy and everything is, you know, 100% super duper. They also struggle. But you can nicely see that for IBS, you really see a difference having a look at that red um, curve here. So bottom line is they really have very often a poor quality of life. And um, there are certain factors actually in, um, influencing the manifestation of IBS, that is age, smoking, your lifestyle, infections, which may cause dysbio dysbiosis, which means that the microbiota are not in order, stress, female sex, because um, two thirds of patients are actually females and genetic factors. And this is where we are um, mainly interested in, in my team. And here again, um, a summary on that. And um, what I'd like um, to mention is that more than 11% um, of the population worldwide suffers from IBS. Um, the symptoms we already discussed and that it has a high impact on their, on their quality of life, but in turn, it also has a high impact on um, the, our societies, the socioeconomic burden. And um, the diagnostics and the therapy are hazy because um, 
Neither specific diagnostics nor adequate treatment exist, as I already told you. And this is basically still based on the fact that the molecular basis is poorly understood and several factors playing a role in um, leaky gut generation are involved in that. And um, our aim is to develop better strategies in order to detect, treat, and even prevent these diseases. And from the knowledge we gain in IBS research, we also may profit in other gut-brain disorders, of course. And um, I just shortly like to introduce these multiple layers again, which play a role. So I told you we are a hollow beyond. So our individual genetic makeup which uh, shapes um, our human body in um, constant communication with the gut um, microbiota. Um, these are the intrinsic factors together with extrinsic factors and I addressed this already like um, lifestyle, stress, smoking, your diet and infection and dysbiosis all together shape networks. Neuronal networks in our little brain in the gut, but also networks in the brain. I told you that there is this communication via the direct connection, but also via other connections going on. I don't go into detail any further. And depending on how the changes in these systems look like in the gut and or in the brain, certain clinical phenotypes, as we say, disorders manifest, either IBS alone or IBS plus migraine and or fibromyalgia or IBS and this and chronic fatigue, depression, anxiety. And if they suffer from all of this, we call that multimorbid irritable bowel syndrome. And of course, also other conditions I was introducing, which are actually now termed gut-brain disorders or brain-gut disorders, depending on the view, um, actually are manifest according to a similar pathophysiology. So we cannot only just take genes or only microbiota or any extrinsic factor take into account. We really have to have a look at the, at the whole picture. We need holistic approaches in order to investigate such kind of disorders. And also, if we treat them, we also need to be holistic, not only gastroenterologists. We really need interdisciplinary teams working with these patients. But I cannot go into detail now. So all I want um, to share for now in terms of our own research, because due to the shortness of time, I cannot go too much into detail, is a little bit about serotonin and its role in, in the human body. So one of the key signaling molecules within the gut is serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine or 5-HT in short. And actually what I didn't know before I started out in working on, on IBS was that actually more than 90% of serotonin is, is actually um, produced in, in the gut in so-called enterochromaffin cells, which release the serotonin after an external stimulus may it be by luminal gut content or by, um, by toxins, by glucose, by any kind um, of ingestion, but also by mediators which are coming from our microbiota. Once it's released, it, um, it acts downstream on different types of serotonin receptors which regulate functions like um, gastrointestinal motility, the secretion and visceral perception, but also mediate pain, emesis and anxiety control to name a few. We know from studies that disturbances in these systems have been found in IBS patients and that, that actually medications targeting these, this system are beneficial in some patients, but we do not know in which patients. And that serotonin function is mediated via a variety of receptors. And this motivated us to follow up the hypothesis that the serotonin system may lead to impaired GI function, 
and thereby contribute to IBS, but also comorbid conditions. And um, this is um, a, a, a nice study I like to only shortly address where colleagues um, of us in Cork in Ireland summed up the knowledge on serotonin and the related metabolisms in the regulation of brain gut or gut brain microbiome axis. And you see the same, the same players here as I have introduced to you now several times. And to make a long story short, and I just scratched the surface on our genetics research, and I thank Bianca for you did the perfect introduction for my talk. So we found several mutations in serotonin type 3 receptor genes, or HDR3 genes for short, in either regulatory regions in the A gene. And these we and others could associate um, with IBS, depression, and anxiety. Furthermore, genes in the B subunit in the recipe in the protein coding region, which we and others could associate with IBS, with eating disorders, and with depression. And furthermore, in the C gene, and this was by us um, associated with IBS, but also with autism by other groups, which I, I think is also very interesting. And the HDR3E gene, another regulatory, so out of the recipe book mutation, which leads to impaired regulation of expression um, of microRNAs. These are tiny little molecules regulating gene expression. And this so far has only been associated with IBS. So if we have a finding like, like this, so these are initial findings in terms of association in small case control cohorts, IBS patients versus control individuals. We look for changes in function, in functional readouts, and for the ones affecting the recipe, we could find changes in signal transduction, which manifest in higher signal transduction. So more um, excitation of receptors, which makes the, cispel, uh, the system more reactive in simple terms. The ones outside the recipe book in the regulatory regions lead to increased expression of the gene, which in turn leads to more receptors and this leads to the same effect, more signal transduction. And we did a um, replication study taking um, these polymorphisms into account in um, more than 12,000 people and from different countries all over the world. And this is um, an endeavor um, by our international genuine network and the only one which we could really confirm was the HDR3E subunit polymorphism. And the others did not associate in this huge cohort. And such kind of studies, which we call replication study and then meta-analysis in different cohorts from all over the place, really only confirmed this one with a reasonable um, increased risk in the carriers of nearly 1.6 times, which is quite huge for a complex disorder. So to sum up, the functional consequences of these polymorphisms are changes in serotonin receptor properties, higher signal transduction levels, and um, so, but what is still missing is the investigation of strict structure and function of native receptors. This is all done in in vitro systems in cell models so far. And our goal is to, to do more research to better understand what's really going on in the patients, to better understand the impaired neuronal signal transduction, which seems to take place in these patients in the ENS, but of course also in the central nervous system, 
And the other variants which we could not associate with IBS in this meta-analysis might be due to the fact that they play a role in the CNS and are probably more pronounced in the manifestation of the psychiatric phenotypes. So in summary, we can say these genes where we found association play a role in visceral perception, but also in the brain-gut axis as well as in the brain. And we now um, have to further explore their functional relevance in these systems. And for this, we need appropriate um, model systems. And I know that um, Stefanie schmidt eckhardt one of my very, very, very talented postdocs in my group, is hardly working on those models and due to shortness of time. And I know I'm already quite over time. I'm sorry, but I'm nearly done now. Um, <laughs> if you start me talk, if you ask me to talk, once I start, I, yeah, I talk. Anyway, I'm nearly done. Uh, yeah, so she's working on these model systems and um, we really hope, and actually I'm quite convinced that they will help us to better understand what's going on there. And for this, and Tiara already introduced that to you, we established the international network Genure, which now consists of more than 20 countries, 22 countries in Europe, but also overseas. Australia, the US and Chile are also part of it, where we aim to dissect, um, dissect uh, the, the pathogenesis of IBS, taking all the different layers into account, the genetics, the microbiota, the, um, the environmental factors with the major aim at the end of the day to build certain subgroups, which we can then treat more specifically. And I'm super proud to share with you the news that we recently got a huge um, Horizon 2020 European um, Commission um, consortium granted, which kicked off in February, where, we'll do, where we will do exactly this, um, dissect IBS and comorbidities and the molecular causes of this, and also the stress and the microbiota playing a role in this. And I also told you that I'm a big advocate. So if you are interested, go to our, uh, on our website and there you can see um, a nice yeah, little clip with take home messages, which is also available with 20, with, with subtitles in um, 20 languages, thanks to my partners in Junior who translated everything. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. By the way, cheers. Um, I don't drink <laughs> beer, but I also, I have a nice German beer glass. Can you see that? <laughs> Google, it's <laughs> a drink inside. 